Akasha, wonderful to have you on the show. How are you? I'm lovely. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, no. Listen, thank you for coming on. I, I cannot wait to talk about the first omen uh, with you. I loved it. Uh, someone asked me to describe it to them the other day, and I said it's got such a sinister atmosphere, it almost leeches off the screen into the auditorium. It creeped Ooh. me out. Good. I love the word leeches. That's great. <laughs> uh, I want to take you back, though, to the beginning of your journey with this film and, and when it first landed on your radar as the the possibility of the first omen becoming your debut feature oh gosh um you know i i thought when i first realized that i was hired and i got to do this movie i was so excited i was outside this record store and i was just doing high kicks and then all of a sudden it dawned on me that i had just gotten hired to do a prequel to the omen and all of a sudden i just had a panic attack and i went oh, what did i just do <laughs> um it was terrifying um but also you know really exhilarating because i think the script let us you know it gave us some real estate to make our own thing but just because you you never want to piss off horror fans, you know, ever. <laughs> and it's a sacred movie. So, um, so yeah, it definitely was a jolt to the system. Because, <laughs> um, I mean, there'd been talk about a, a prequel as far back, I think, around 2016 was when I first heard about it. But when you came to it, was there a script already in place? Were you presented with something to read that was was already, I guess, an outline of what this story was going to become? Yeah, absolutely. And and um, I think you're right. I think that's when the the script was starting to be developed was back then. Um, and so when my partner and I inherited it, it was already like the bones and the structure and the characters were there, you know, which was really exhilarating. Um, and then we kind of came at it from this perspective of, you know, really embedding yourself in the female POV and making it more about female body autonomy and, and body horror through the female lens. Um, yeah. So that was kind of what we did. Can people see my hands? I don't know how yeah. to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's very, it's very minority report. You're conducting with your hands. Yeah. This is an official writing term right here. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is funny that you say you don't want to piss off horror fans because I mean they are they are a the loveliest uh, genre fans I think in the whole of movie land but also they know their stuff and if you you get it wrong they let you know well if you want to go to war you you rally the horror fans you know <laughs> like the most loyal um, cerebral I think of all fan dumb um, so yeah, the, definitely that was my biggest fear. Actually, I was just so because I'm a I'm a horror fan, you know. I I know the the rabid fury that can come out. Um, so that was, yeah, that was my nightmare. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, uh, uh, let's talk about the, the 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 panic attack outside the record shop because obviously the, the <laughs> 1976 <laughs> original. It, it, I, I don't want to I don't want to give you flashbacks, but it is a, it's a revered movie. So. Did you have any any trepidation? Not not so much in terms of audience reaction, but in terms of any constraints that might be placed on your creativity as a filmmaker because there was this original film. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. You know, um, I think there there is twofold. Is you, we didn't want to try and do what Richard Donner did, just because I can't do what Richard Donner did. I mean, like we we had we watched them in a million times, and I think. You know, watching that, it's just such a elegant movie and so grounded and um, and elevated. And I just wasn't there um, as a filmmaker. Um, and I think what I tend to lean towards is, is a little bit more twisted, a little bit more um, strangely darker. Can you say that? I mean, um, and and maybe a little bit more gonzo. Um, which was not what the original Omen was, you know? So I I feel like, you know, if the original Omen is a Michelin star restaurant, I'm probably fried mozzarella sticks at a dive bar, you know? And so it's like, how do you, how do you mesh that? Um, <laughs> uh, I, I'm a fan of that analogy. I like both. I like both. <laughs> right? So I think it was, 
it ended up working out really well in in my opinion when we kind of narrowed in on the themes and we're like okay if you're going to do a prequel to the omen it's going to be about how was damien born which is themes about birth which is themes about the female body which i love body horror and so that was kind of our our doorway in and how to to mesh these two sensibilities so it's um I, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about the body horror in a moment, but but I do think, uh, on a personal note, I think what your film does uh, fantastically is the way it dovetails into the um, original film. And I had Ralph Einson on this show not that long ago, and he makes a fantastic younger father, Brennan. He's got that intensity. He's It's so beautiful because Ralph, you know, we were talking so much about the Patrick Troughton performance, and I said to him, you know, like when I was a kid out of anything, Patrick Troughton probably scared me the most out of that movie just because he's, he's, uh, you know, so fervent and a little unhinged and, and, um, and that was, um, we, what we were wondering is like, how do you make, how do you make Father Brennan really relatable so that you understand why he's like that in the 76 version? And what Ralph does so well is he can wear that that horrible weight on his soul, on his face, and in his physicality, you know. And he's um, not to mention he has just black velvet for a voice, so you know he'll be talking to me, and I'll just be listening. And, and, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and he's but it, it, you're absolutely right because I think in the original one of the scenes that I I I, I always think. God, you know, yeah, you played that wrong, Father Brennan. When he's trying to convince uh, Gregory Peck's character of like, you know, this is this is bad news, and he's just so much, and you're like, I'd kick him out. I'd be like, get this lunatic out of here. And and, and Ralph has a little bit of that in this as well. I just remember being such a little kid and just like I was, I was fine with you know um, somebody's head getting severed and everything. But when it came to Patrick Trout, and I was just like, Mama, who is that man? <laughs> What is happening? <laughs> uh, you uh, you mentioned uh, Ralph's uh, delicious uh, voice. Um, that opening scene, you have two of the most iconic voices in cinema history in confessional booths next to each other um, in, in Ralph and Charles Dance. I mean, that, that was a conscious choice, right? Oh, my God. Well, it was such a conscious choice that I was like, we don't even need picture. What if we just had their voices and people were like, you're crazy. <laughs> you, you have these guys on screen, you put them on screen. But they just, there's so much going on that they, it could have, it could have just been audio. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I get chills when I hear both of their voices and, and sometimes you, you can just kind of close your eyes during the takes because it's so lovely. Um, but, and then to hear them together was really a treat. I mean, they're both just really lovely men. Um, but they, I thought they played so well off of each other. They were great. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a heck of an opening. I can say hell. We're talking about the omen, the first omen. It's a hell of an opening. Um, yeah. Let me let me mention uh, that scene uh, because it, 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 your movie has earned the the, uh, the 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 lovely two words. It features that scene. Now, not every movie features a that scene. Um, Tell me how it feels to have a movie that will forevermore be that scene. Doing the minority <laughs> report again. It's it's amazing. You know, it's really cool. It's just wonderful to to watch people's reactions because horror fans are also the most jaded fans, I think, you know. And during our preview, am I allowed to talk about it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I mean, the, yeah. the, the movie's out. I, I, I think I'll, do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to say right now, there's going to be a spoiler here. If you haven't seen the first time and get your ass to the cinema right now, go and watch the first time and then come back and listen to the answer to this question. All right. I think yes. we're good. Thank you. Okay. When, so in these preview testings, right, you get to sit with the audience and um, it's so fun because you're, you're kind of watching the audience. You're not watching the movie. And um, when the vagina came on screen, the boy in front of me who had just been downing this giant bag of M&Ms the whole time, 
he, his mouth opened and M&Ms fell out. And I was just like, I don't know how this movie is going to, to do in this preview, but that's all I needed. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, I uh, I see your uh, I see your jaded horror fans, and I raise you even more jaded movie journalists and film critics, which was the audience I watched it with, and you could feel the atmosphere in the room change. There was a stunned silence, and it takes a mm. lot, a lot to break through that cynicism of film journalists. But you could feel it in the room, going, "The hell is happening? Oh my god! Incredible." Thank you. I, I, I really appreciate that. Thank you. And I think, you know, it was so um, we, we were talking a lot about pace when it came to this this movie, um, just because just looking at pace for for set pieces and scares, but also just overall structure and really studying 1970s horror for that. And, you know, really, there aren't any scares really until that moment, you know, so you're kind of just relaxed and then we try and hit you with a hundred percent. And I think that's, um, I don't know for, for the patient audience. I, I just love that moment for them. Yeah. It's a, it's an incredible moment. David Cronenberg, eat your heart out. Um, how was it when you pitched that to Disney? Well, yeah, try, try pitching a vagina shot to Disney, you know, <laughs> so, I love yeah. it. It actually went better than expected because they hired me, you know, it was, it was kind of this very surreal moment where um, my partner and I were talking like, you know, these are some very intense themes that we're talking mm -hmm. about. And if we're going to do it, we're going to do it. We're not going to shy away from the imagery. So what's the most, like, what image holds the theme the most? Um, let's pitch that image. And of course it's this shot, you know, it's, it's this woman's being violated from the, inside out um so you know you're on the zoom and there's lots of faces and we pitch the scene and then we say and then this is the shot and this is what we want to show on screen and that shot is the movie and then it goes silent and you're like oh god you know you pick up your laptop and you're like shaking it because you think it's frozen you know but really the reality is that you just pitched a vagina to disney and it takes a minute you know um and then <laughs> Disney, or uh, sorry, David Goyer is there. He's one of the main squares. And he just starts nodding and goes, yes. And then slowly everybody starts to nod. And I was like, oh my God, this might happen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. Uh, yeah, I want to talk about uh, your producers, uh, David and, and, and Kevin, uh, a little bit later. And I think another reason uh, why um, that shot, but a, a lot of... Um, some of the, the the real horror in this works is because like y the film is so beautiful like it you know it it, it elevates um like horror a, a lot of the time we're not used to seeing horror as you know as beautiful and, and you know the way you capture rome in the the 70s is 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 really something special Thank you. was were there were there films that inspired you or perhaps even subconsciously you were influenced by in the way you approach the look for this film yeah you know what i think that um like right originally what we were looking at a lot of was the alan pakula gordon willis collaboration so like all the president's men clue parallax view um just really looking at those not just for visuals but but pacing and character development um so like clue was kind of the north star when it came to character development and kind of the subversion of what you think a horror film is going to be you know, you think when you walk into Clute, you think you're going to watch a movie about a serial killer killing prostitutes. And really, you're watching a character study of a woman, a very complex woman. Um, but to be honest with you, we went to Rome before we were hired. And um, it was kind of this magical moment where we had no idea, but we were going to Rome on, and I say we, my, my creative partner, Tim Smith and I, who's also a co-writer and an EP, um, I'm not crazy. <laughs> <There's no person. laughs> um, we, we landed in Rome on Dante, Dante Aguilari's 750th uh, anniversary of his death. So there are all these art galleries dedicated to 
um, paintings that depicted hell and the topography of hell. And that mixed with all of the other religious iconography that is just everywhere in Rome. Like you don't have to go to a museum. You can just walk into a church because there are a million and one churches in Rome um, that have the most beautiful artwork and there's Caravaggio's everywhere. So I think it was kind of this this blending subconsciously in our brains of 70s, um, you know, conspiracy thrillers with religious artwork. Wow. Sorry, you froze just for a moment there. I wasn't, I thought I wasn't being, okay. saying, it's fine. You're back now. I just, just that was it. That was, that was a, a pregnant pause, but it was, oh, I shouldn't have used the word like, pregnant in this interview. Okay, you didn't like uh, that answer. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> there was a brief moment where you froze. I was like, ah, no, uh, we're fine. Um, so let, let me ask you this. Obviously, um, the first time, and it's not alone in uh, films revisiting iconic horror franchises. Uh, what yours does is um, does it really well. So you are the, the perfect person to ask uh, when it comes to adding a new installment to these iconic franchises. What are the, are there any real do's or don'ts that you've learned from your journey with the first Omen? Yes, and I I just lost you. One second. I'm so sorry. Oh, no, okay, can right. you hear me now? Yeah, I've got you now. Yeah, I can repeat the question. Oh, yeah, I will. Okay. I can re- no, do's and don'ts. I got you. Okay, cool. What is happening? Um, okay, here we go. No, I think um, one of the things that we really did not want to do was mimic or try to redo something. You know, we have the hanging scene. Um, obviously, that is, I think, was a very important homage to everybody and trying to come at it with through a different context or a different tone um, was really something that was really important Um, and I think also something else that we were trying to do is have a conversation with the film rather than try and remake the film so what what was not only the 1976 omen trying to say but what were the films around that film trying to say you know, like Rosemary's Baby, The Exorcist, like culturally what was going on at that time? Like there was, <clears throat> you know, just mass distrust of institutions. There was the counterculture, like parents were starting to be terrified of their kids, hence them being represented demonically all the time. Sorry, I, I'm not a smoker. I have really bad asthma. So one second. <clears throat> no worries. And so, so what, how do you answer back to that? time. And I think, you know, what Tim and I talked a lot about was just looking at what we're afraid of right now. Culturally, I think that maybe tables have turned and I think kids are really afraid of their parents. And that's where cultural and I don't don't know, like cultural mistrust, but institutional mistrust is coming from. Like there is such a generational divide. There's a political divide, obviously, but I think a lot of that's generational as well. And so that was how we wanted to engage. Well, um, I think you engage with those themes incredibly well. And I would recommend if anyone hasn't been out to see the first Omen yet, hit your local cinema right now. It really is a fantastic watch. And then we can all talk about that scene together. Uh, Right now, we are going to talk about the first Omen a little bit more as we go on our journey. But it is time, Akasha, to leave this reality and enter a dimension of pure film where our virtual cinema awaits. You are our guide. We are your audience. Let's go on your perfect trip to the movies so we push open the doors to our temple of film and find ourselves in the foyer there's an excited buzz as there always is in a cinema foyer the hum of anticipation it's your perfect cinema trip who have you picked living or dead to go with you okay this is a very corny answer but i picked my writing partner tim smith yeah wonderful yeah that is not a corny answer at all. That is uh, that is fantastic. Uh, tell me, tell me why you have picked Tim Smith, your writing partner. He is wonderful, first of all, but I'm pretty sure he came out of the womb knowing that he wanted to make films, and so he's studied every single film under the sun. He knows everything, and it's quite wonderful and annoying. And um, it's also really good because nothing gets to him ever. So if he moves 
or his eyes widen at all during a movie, you know, man, that's a moment. That's good, you know? So it's very exciting to watch him, but also watch the screen. <laughs> So tell me what your writing process together is like. Is, is it is it someone works on the script for a bit and then hands it over to the other person? Or is, are you both in the room at the same time jotting down notes as you're, uh, you're, you're, you're chatting? Or is it, how, 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 what is your routine when it comes to writing with the, the first omen? Yeah, well, it was really, you know, we were very, um, we were very lucky that when we were writing the first omen, we were actually staying at, Tim's grandparents' ranch out off the grid in Texas. Um, so every evening we would make a big bonfire and and kind of brainstorm and talk about the the script. Um, and so we'll we'll have these big kind of bonfire conversations, and then we'll go off and each write a scene and then trade the scene and then trade it again and slowly you forget whose ideas were what or who's saying what to, you know. Um, but, but it's always very fun because you start to have, have a conversation, you know, you have, you talk forever, but then you actually get to continue the conversation with each other through the script pages, which is always really fun. Do you have any, any, any crazy rules? Like if, if like some writers I, I've heard, they, when they're, with their writing partners, they can get fixated on a line. Like someone wants one line and someone has another version of the same line. How many times do you get to change the other person's line before you're not allowed to change it anymore? Oh, no, infinite amount of times, you know, you change it all you want. You just can't be mean. That is what we, right. we learned. Like, don't be mean to each other. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, it is you and your writing partner, Tim Smith, going to the cinema. There is a clock on the wall in the foyer. It reads a specific time. What time of day have we gone to the cinema? It's anywhere between 10 a.m. and 1 p.m. I think that's the perfect time. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that's a that's a slightly quieter screening then. Not the, not the not the jam packed screening of the evening. No, it's like you're up, you're alert, you're awake. You go in, and it's like the diehards are there at 10 a.m. You know, and so it's like nobody's going to take their phone out. Nobody's going to accidentally turn their flashlight on and dance all around. It's like people who are there are there. Cinema purists. Yeah, yes. I get it. I get it. Well, let me take you to a, a, another situation. You touched on this uh, slightly earlier. Um, talk me through the first time you watched The First Omen in, in a crowded, a packed auditorium, the very first time. When, where was that? And how were you feeling in your head when the movie began in that room? Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm trying to remember what theater it was, but... It's, it's so funny. Do you ever have this feeling where, you know, you've, you've watched a movie when you were really young and it has like a very prominent place in your childhood memory, or it's a movie that just really deeply affected you. And so then when you see it with other people, it feels like they're seeing a very personal part of you and you don't want to share that. And so <laughs> I actually got quite angry when I was watching it with a group because I was like, no, this is mine. <laughs> you know, why would they shut your eyes? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah yeah i get I, I get that do you ever do that thing where you show someone a movie that they haven't seen that means a lot to you and you spend the entire like time watching them watching the movie and if they don't react how you want them to react at a certain bit you're like i don't think we can be friends anymore oh there are many many you know the big chill is strangely one of those movies for me i'm like if you don't like the big chill like what's going on you know i don't know why that's such a, a random movie to be a litmus test but I, don't know, I react very strangely to movies that I really love. You know, when I was in film school, um, the the library has all these movies that you can check out, you know, and I checked out um, Tarkovsky's The Mirror and I had such a emotional, visceral reaction to that movie that I did not return it because I didn't want other people to watch it because <laughs> that's rational, right? That's what an adult does. And the, the librarian was so sweet. He goes, okay, you have $300 in fines or you can just pay $30 and buy the movie. And I was like, I'll buy it, but are you going to get another copy so that other people can watch it? Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. She's a psycho. Okay. Uh, right then. Well, on that note, I'm sending you to the cinema, uh, to the cinema uh, in the morning, early afternoon, any time between 10 and 1. Now, you book the tickets for this trip. Thank you very much. Where in the auditorium are we going to be sitting? 
Well, it depends on the size of the screen, but generally I'll be center front row. The front row? I'm a front row girl. Uh, this is one of the least picked seats on the show, I can tell you. Why do you love the front row? Because I like to feel like I'm diving into a pool of images. It's just like you just want to be surrounded by it so that you can do the, you know, the whirl about with your, your head and you're still in that world. <laughs> and also, you know, you don't like, I do have, I don't know if you picked up on this. I hate when people take out cell phones in movies. It drives yeah. me up the wall. And if you're front row, you don't see any of that. That is true. It is, there's nothing worse than enjoying a movie only to, A, first of all, be ripped out of the immersion, uh, but B, like, be angry as well. Like, if you're, like, being angry in a cinema is, like, the worst place to ever be angry. It's, like, it's almost blasphemous. It's so sad. It's the saddest. I actually, you know, Tim and I go to the New Bev all the time because they have the, the no cell phone policy. And I just, it's, it's just like church. It's like the safest place in L.A., you know, so when you say, I mean, I love this. Uh, they, they they have a no cell phone policy, as in, like, it, like, I, how do they enforce that though? Because I mean, like, because I I often think the people who bring out a cell phone in a in an auditorium, they're the kind of people that aren't gonna like if there's a no cell phone rule, they're not gonna care. They're still gonna do it. Like, do, are they ejected? Please tell me they're ejected. They get kicked out for life. What? Yes. Yes, they do not mess around there. They are serious. Yeah. That, that may be the best thing I've ever heard on this show. Uh, I love that. It's love beautiful. that. Uh, right then, on that note, final thing we need before we leave the foyer and start making our way towards the auditorium. The air is full of wonderful smells. All manner of snacks and foodstuffs are available at the various counters. What are you choosing to eat? Okay. I usually get a lot of hot dogs and not just one or two. I'll usually get maybe three and then I'll gorge them right before the movie. Yeah. This is the super sexy answer of the week. I'm sure. But, um, and then I'll drink tons of coffee and, uh, see what happens. It's a horrible habit, but I don't know what overcomes me. Hey, I, it, it, I, it's a, it's a strong, it's a strong answer. Three hot dogs, and a coffee. So uh, you, you, no interest in uh, in popcorn? No interest in, in fizzy drinks? No, I, I like stuff that you can gorge right before the movie starts. Three three is like a, a big day for me. I'll probably, right. you know, average probably like, yeah, that's a lot. But yeah. but I do eat multiple hot dogs. Um, I, I mean, movies yeah. are getting longer. So that, 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 that makes sense. Yeah. But, but finishing it all right before the movie starts is a big deal. So it's like you walk into a movie theater, there's 10 minutes to go. You hear a lot of strange snarling, chewing, <laughs> drooling. <laughs> You're probably in the same movie as me. <laughs> snarling and drooling. Wonderful, wonderful adjectives. <laughs> uh, right, then, let's leave the foyer. We have everything we need. We push open the door to the corridor down towards the auditorium. Now, the corridor's looking a little bare right now, so I'm going to put up posters of some of your most important movie memories. And the first poster I'm going to put up depicts your fondest movie memory. Wild at Heart by David Lynch. That movie completely derailed my life. Um where I was going to be a photojournalist. I went to school to be a photojournalist. I was working at the LA Times. And then I saw Wild at Heart and it's like my heart exploded. And I thought like, I didn't know you were allowed to do that. And then I applied to AFI and just blindly went because I was obsessed. So, and, uh, so, so I mean, like, so, we can establish so wild at heart was the, the 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 david lynch i think it's 1990 like the david lynch movie that that made you want to become a filmmaker yeah it was it was wild and it it was i haven't really experienced anything quite like that despite my um my you know maniac response to the mirror um but it was just like fall it was like i fell in love instantly and i know that sounds really corny but it was like intoxication where 
you know, you hear that music and you see the flames just in the title sequence. And I was just like, like, I had never seen anything like that before. You know, I didn't know that people made movies like that. I didn't know movies could be like that. And I wanted to do that, you know? And, uh, and so you went straight to, straight to AFI and, and said, I want to be, I want to be a filmmaker. How did, how did that go? I mean, you were, you were accepted, I, I think. Well, it was a, quite an embarrassing moment because because they accept you based on discipline. And I just checked a box. I didn't know what these jobs were. I didn't know what a cinematographer was. I didn't know what a director was, you know. So I was like, director sounds pretty good. That's what David Lynch is, you know. So I checked that. And they're like, why do you want to be a director? And I was like, David Lynch. And they're like, yes, but to you, what is a director? And I was like, I don't know what that means. But please <laughs> <leave in."> <laughs> <laughs> They were very kind. They let me in. They didn't kick me out, you know. Oh, um, so did that begin a, 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 a love affair with uh, David Lynch's work or, or does Wild at Heart occupy a kind of special place? I mean, it, of course, it, it it's like a, a first lover. You know, it always occupies a very special place in my heart. But I'm I'm across the board a fan. Like, I watch Fire Walk with me multiple times a year. You know, I'm... Blue Velvet has like my DVDs worn out. I'm yeah. And where do you stand on the Lost Highway? I I, I used to we had fights about the Lost Highway in school because some people were like, well, it's a work of genius, and some people were like, it doesn't make any bloody sense. You know what is so interesting is that like when when you list your top five David Lynch films, Lost Highway is never at the top for me. Until recently, actually, when I rewatched it a few years ago and I was reading um, Room to Dream, his his book hmm. that just came out, and I learned that he was inspired by the O.J. Simpson murder case and, um, and that seeing O.J. Simpson, you know, in the chase, in the, in the, um, the white Bronco, yeah, that seeing him being chased on um, on TV is what gave birth to this idea. And he was like, "Some whore is so so dreadful that even if you have committed it, you can't admit to yourself that you have done something so gruesome." And that's what the movie is about: is like splitting your brain and trying to to kind of abscond to this fantasy life that we tell ourselves, which is kind of the most, the most frightening thing, because if you think about it, we all do that on a daily basis is have this fantasy ideal version of ourselves that we're actually living um, rather than the reality. So yeah, I I'm with whoever said it's a brilliant film. <laughs> I, I, I will admit to not having seen it in years, but I do remember there, are, I think it's a, I think it's a POV shot. Um, in is it Bill Pullman's house? There's just like this. There's something going up the stairs, and I remember going, "That's absolutely like terrifying." Oh, it's t it's absolutely terrifying. And then also having evil personified by Robert Blake mm. is absolutely. You know, um, a few years after that, Robert Blake was accused of killing his wife, or supposedly shot his wife. Yeah. Had it no yeah. had his wife killed. Sorry, mm. yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's like, it's, it's kind of, it's interesting. It's like in these movies that really tap into something, you really invite certain things in, you know? Mm -hmm. Right then. Well, we're not putting up a poster for the lost highway, putting up a poster for 1990s <laughs> wild at heart is your fondest movie memory. Okay. The next poster, however, depicts your worst movie memory. Okay. Have you seen this Bruno Dumont film, uh, 29 Palms? No, uh, but in preparation for this interview, I did my due diligence and I looked it up and I read the synopsis and I'm really glad I've never seen it. But tell me, tell me, tell us, tell everyone what, what, what your experience with this film. Yeah. So and there's two films called 29 Palms, but this is not the heist film. Yeah, this. Yeah, this is the experimental horror film um, that I don't think it took me maybe like it actually, I think caused me to go into a slight depression for four months. It really rocked me. Um, in, and it's interesting because it's, you know, any horror film that has no supernatural elements, no maniac, it's just real people in real life and how real life can go horribly wrong so quickly. That's really what terrifies me. 
And like, I feel like I spend my life kind of trying to create this like buffer from things like that. Um, and this one just kind of, you know, a friend just recommended it and he's like, you like horror, watch this. And I watched that and I was like, oh, that that's like existential horror that just broke my brain. And um, I can't go outside now. Thank you. Um, and such an interesting, you know, um, I think analysis of, of, of gender dynamics and relationship dynamics and um, and just like taking this man who's obviously um, internally very emasculated and having the most emasculating act ever happen to him is don't watch it. I mean, watch <laughs> it. It's a great film, but it, it will really like it, it will, it's not like fun horror. It's, it's like real life horror. I, uh, yeah, I completely under understand uh, where you're coming from. The, it's the unexpected, like you can have everything in order. You can know what your day looks like to you. But then that's that, you know, the the horrible uh, potential of something completely unplanned happening, whatever that might be. In this case, some rednecks turning up and uh, ruining your holiday uh, yes. is the scary, scary thing. Yes. Hmm. Right, then. Uh, I'm not saying I'll watch it, but I am putting up a poster for 29 Palms. Bruno Dumont's 2003 film is your worst movie memory. And the next poster depicts the last performance that brought you to tears okay this is gonna sound like a joke um no not this part but so Thelma and Louise I watched for the first time in full recently over COVID and I sobbed to the point where my partner was like are you okay do I need to call your mother like what is happening <laughs> but the truth was it is a brilliant film. So like just hi everybody knows this hyper progressive for its time. But, you know, I started watching movies because my grandmother would tape them off of the TV onto VHS for me when I was growing up. And then she would mail me this giant box of VHSs and whatever was in there. I'd just watch, you know, it was a lot of Martha Stewart episodes. But um, but there was also, you know, great films like Thelma and Louise. She stopped the tape before. They drove off the cliff. I never knew they died. Oh, wow. And then, and then we're in COVID and they start revving up the engine, headed for the cliff. And I'm like, this is, no, this is not how this movie ends. And then they sail off the cliff and the credits roll. And I was livid. And then that gave way to just pure depression. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So, so you'd spent years not realizing the end of Thelma and Louise had that the the iconic "let's keep going" moment. No, I just remember. You know, it's so funny because I watched it when I was young, like maybe maybe not even my teens yet. You know, and I just remember it being like this fun girl trip movie, and then rewatching it, I'm like, oh no, this is like a hyper feminist war cry that ends in death <laughs> and that is not what my grandmother showed me <laughs> oh, um right well i am absolutely happy to put a poster for thelma and louise as the last performance that brought you to tears up and uh, talking of performances what an incredible and um, fearless performance uh from your lead in the first omen uh, nell tiger free um what made her perfect? Because she really is um, astonishing in this movie uh, for Margaret. Like, was it was it there from the first time you, you met her and started discussing the role, her understanding of it? Was it an audition? How, how, how did you realize that she was going to be so great in this movie? Well, I think you even said it just that she's fearless. And mm. I think that's, oh that's such, no, it's, it's insane. And it's so key to have in your collaborators. But, you know, we were huge fans of Servant. Um, and so we we're like, oh, we really, we really want to talk to Nell. And she was very kind. You know, she, she didn't have to read for us, but she, she read two scenes over a Zoom, quote unquote, audition, um, where she did the scene. One of the scenes was when she realizes that it was her that night. And she was like, you know, very, very pleasant and lovely and professional. And I said, do you want to talk about the scene. Do you want to talk about any of the beats or the character? And she was like, no, I'm just going to do it. 
And I was like, oh, oh, okay. And then she, something in her switched. You can see it. You literally can see it in her eyes. Something switches. And she went full Isabella on Johnny and stunned all of us. We were all silent. I started crying. And then she popped out. And she was like, do you have any notes? And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. It, it's like, it's very interesting because it is like she becomes possessed for a second. Mm -hmm. um, she was fantastic. Uh, yeah, I mean, she she is she's fantastic in this movie. Oh, well, I think uh, we we might be talking about uh, Isabel and Johnny in, in a little while as well. Um, now, the final poster, however, we're putting up a poster for Thelma and Louise. Last performance brought you to tears. The final poster depicts your unpopular movie opinion. Oh well, I don't know if this is an unpopular opinion, but I just think that horror doesn't get its due. And I think that horror can be elevated just as much as any other genre. And in fact, I feel like kind of the path that's being paved is that horror is eventually going to become prestige cinema. Because there are some just out of this world performances that I think, you know, we should be hearing about at the Oscars, you know, like Tony Collette and Hereditary. Like I, to me, that's an Oscar winning performance. Um, and I think you're asking actors to go to some intensely dark, deep places. They're having to dive quite deep. And um, and I, I think that at some point that should be recognized on a larger stage. Um, I don't know whether it'll surprise you or not, but this, this conversation has come up uh, before on the show, the fact that horror is consistently overlooked um, by awards bodies as though there is something... There is something not worthy of the genre that it's too niche or for whatever reason that it, it's not recognized. And people have offered their theories. Uh, my favorite is people who are on people who, who, who vote for awards are snobs and they just don't appreciate good horror. But you look at the stats and it's like, uh, I think, you know, this depending on how loose you use the, the, the term horror, there's only been like six best picture nominees in the history of like the Oscars that have been horror movies. Yeah, but you know why I think that is? I think that horror is the most pure genre in terms of reflecting what is going on culturally at the time. And I think that sometimes that might touch a nerve too much, you know? And it might speak a little too much truth. Because it's like, you know when you're at Thanksgiving and that the aunt that always tells you how it is shows up and she'll say like, you've gained weight, you treat your husband poorly, but you have, you know, your outfit looks great. And it's like, she'll just like come at you. And that's tough sometimes, you know, that's what horror is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I, I think what, what fits there, uh, that, that argument as well is uh, the, the last horror movie to be nominated for best picture was get out, which obviously, you know, again, to, to go back to what you were Saying about Tony Collette and Hereditary, I mean Daniel Kaluuya in that. What 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 an astonishing performance! Uh, you know, a career defining performance. Absolutely, and it's like it takes and Get Out rang a really big bell. You know, that was nobody could ignore that. Not even the Oscars. Um, but I think that I don't know. You, I hope. I think that horror is going to become more recognized because there are such amazing films like that coming out. I absolutely hope so. I hope you're right. And that's, that's an exciting, uh, that's an exciting thing uh, to look forward to because I think it, it, it should be um, right then. We're leaving the corridor. We've reached the last set of doors. We're entering the auditorium. There is a crowd uh, hoping to join you in the auditorium with Tim. Do you want to let them in or do you want it just you and Tim for this movie? It's totally up to you. No, this one I think everybody needs to join. I think everybody needs to fill this theater. Right. Well, the crowd go wild. They're pouring into the auditorium. And now before the movie begins, there are a few things we're going to play on the big screen. And first of all, it's a trailer. The trailer for the movie you are most looking forward to seeing at the cinema. Robert Eggers' Nosferatu remake. Oh. 
I am so excited about this. I know that they've been researching it for what feels like maybe a couple of years now. Um, Ralph is in it. I'll watch anything with Ralph. Um, I just think that his films are so beautifully crafted that they are true trans, like you just are transported to a completely different time. And um, talk about a fearless filmmaker. I mean, I'll, anything he makes, I'll watch. <laughs> um, ag- agree. Strongly agree. Yeah, I mean, I, The Witch, uh, The Lighthouse. Oh, I mean, yes. You are just taken to these often terrifying places. Yeah. Yeah, he, and it's great to see somebody taking really big swings, no matter what. The trailer for Robert Eggers' Nosferatu plays. Now, the next moment we're going to play on the big screen is... The moment that makes you literally or metaphorically pump your fist in the air. Okay. So this is <laughs> probably an obvious one, but it is Isabella and Johnny's performance in the subway scene in possession, which we shamelessly pay homage to in this film. Um, I have never, this is another moment. It was very similar to when I saw wild at heart where I was like, I didn't know you could do that. Um, yet it spoke to something that I, I don't, I don't know if you can articulate the feeling really. I think it's something that maybe a lot of women feel. And that's why so many women responded to that performance is that it really touched something very deep within the female core. Um, Just the, the tumult and the frustrations and the violence. And it, it felt like you were watching something so deeply personal that you shouldn't be watching it. Yet it was so, intensely relatable that I was like crying. I cry a lot, um, crying and just like, yes, yes, yes. The whole time, you know? And so that's why we just had, it wasn't even really a decision to pay homage to that in this film. It was a physical compulsion on, on both me and Mel's part. <laughs> it's a, uh, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's so effective in, in your film, um, as well as obviously 1981's possession, but in your film, just, I think for for a lot of people and a lot of people who probably haven't seen Possession as well, it's it's one of those scenes that you just don't expect the camera to linger on as long. I think most of the time you'd sort of because we all have this ingrained idea of what what happens in a movie, and when that when that's broken and you suddenly you're kept somewhere for longer in a moment that is very disturbing, it, it does it rattles you as a moviegoer. Well, I think part of the horror is is not cutting away from that and realizing like, oh, it's still going and we are still here. And you start to get this, like a a claustrophobia takes over you, you know? Um, And then it it goes from, I feel like you go through these phases. Like I remember watching the subway scene. I went through like, holy hell, what is happening? This is so electric to, oh my God, we are still here. It is still going on to, oh, this is so tragic that there is so much buried inside that it takes this long to get out, you know? Um, So it's fun when you see performances in a shot that has different stages for you to go through. Yeah. 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 And and again, again, as we mentioned earlier, a a fearless performance from an L Tiger Free. All right, then. Let's play something else on the big screen. This is what you consider cinema's most shocking moment. And this, this is a very personal shocking moment um but nashville is one of my favorite movies of all time the altman film and i think when i first watched it i didn't fully understand enough about what was going on at the time when the movie was shot for me to to anticipate this moment but um barbara jean is on stage you know uh our loretta lynn stand-in and um, and out of nowhere, she's shot by somebody in the audience. And it happens in a wide, like you are where it's a it's a concert performance and you're you're going in to see some of the singing, but then you mostly stay out wide to see the big crowd and her on stage. And you just see the violence of her getting yanked back. And because he kept it in a wide, you think, oh my God, did that actually happen? Did I see that? You know, and then you blink and you say, like, no, she's missing from the stage. And it's I think it it it's one of the reasons why I think the hanging 
in the original Omen works so well is because it's this absolute violence coming out of nowhere and you can't anticipate it and it feels random and it, which makes you feel extremely vulnerable. It's, um, uh, it's, it, it's, a, uh, when you say that you didn't fully understand what was going on, it, was it, were you quite young when you first saw it or, or, or not? Cause I, I have this thing where I, I've watched films. I think sometimes things in films impact you more when you're young and don't understand the nuance of the scene. And you're just like, what the hell just happened? Like it, it get it gets, it, it affects you more. Well, yeah, I think because when you don't understand the motivation of violence, it feels unpredictable and unhinged. And, um, and that's the scariest thing in the world, I think for us. Right. And then, yeah. And then watching it when I'm older, I'm like, okay, this is a movie about the corruption of, of creativity and, but not just of, you know, the music industry, but of the country as a whole politically. And just knowing that there were so many um, assassinations during that time and people are grappling with, with exactly that, you know, somebody being shot in the middle of a parade yeah. or a concert. Um, it's, it is people trying to um, reckon with that. And the, the, the fact that the audience don't react is sort of, it, it, I think that's, um, that, I think that speaks to the idea that, you know, I think to, to try and put a positive slant on it, it's, it, it is Robert Altman basically saying, well, you know, people, people sort of just carry on. Like, you know, it's like you, it, you have to carry on. So when, um, I forget the character's name, the girl who picks up the microphone after, um, after Barbara Jean's been shot and it's just like, okay, so we just have to carry, carry on like uh, as normal. Like you can't, and you can't be destroyed by this horrible act. Not just that, but singing, um, you may say that I'm not free, but that don't bother me. This idea that, that in order to survive, you have to actively ignore the fact that you don't, you don't actually have rights that you're just kind of a pawn in, in, in the game that's controlled by other people. And that was the, the saddest and the most cynical, I think, realization when I watched it, when I became older, that, that not only are you complicit, but you're, you're um, almost engaged in that, you know? Yeah. 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 yeah it's uh, yeah. Uh, well, that's why you've picked it. It is one of cinema's most shocking moments. I, I agree. And, uh, I think your I think your moment that scene as I, I call it at the top is certainly going to be making that list in the future for other people's most shocking moment. Did you did you have a bit of back and forth with the MPA over getting that scene clear? Oh, just a little I... bit. <laughs> just a little bit of a dance. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. It turns out uh, the ratings board does not want to see vaginas on screen. Um, yeah. Uh, body bisections and, you know, intense body horror violence and rape is fine. A demon penis is totally fine, but a vagina is not. That is um, apparently the most offensive image in our film. Um, and I don't know how much time we have, but I do feel very compelled to tell you this story is that we, you can't, they don't tell you what they want you to cut, right? You have to kind of be Nancy Drew and figure it out. And it finally came down to this full frontal vagina shot, not after it's being violated by the hand, but before. So when it's just a vagina, that's when it's the most offensive. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. That's, that's insane. So the minute you have a demonic claw emerging, it's like, no, 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 that's, that, that, that's fine. Cause that's like horror. That's sort of scary demons and stuff, but yeah. just a vagina. No, just that's not vagina. acceptable. I'm going to make another film and it's just going to be a vagina for two hours. <laughs> uh, uh, right then. Let's uh, move on. A couple more questions before we get to the movie you've picked to screen for us tonight. First of all, what is the line of dialogue or piece of dialogue from a movie that has most affected you? Okay. I grew up watching Blade Runner, the original one. Uh, yeah. And yeah, as I'm sure most of us did. And Rucker Hauer's performance in that has haunted me ever since I first saw it as a child. But it was really his monologue at the end, the, the tears and rain monologue, 
that really affected me. And for the first time I realized, you know, I think what that monologue did to me when I was a kid was I realized like, oh, I'm going to die. <laughs> you know, we're all going to die. <laughs> Because you don't think about that when you're a kid, you know, but I was so in love with Rucker. And so I was really tuned into what he was saying and I didn't want his character to disappear. And then he said those lines and I just remember having the sinking feeling like, oh, this will happen to me one day. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah it's an astonishing monologue as well because it does like i think there's only a couple of moments in that movie which does a bit of world building earlier on they talk about off world and the replicants have come from off world but that speech the whole townhouse uh, gate uh, sea beam it's glittering like it, it it world builds at the very end it goes look there's a whole universe of stuff out there that this replicant has seen yeah yeah and it, it's it was so you know i we heard from because we got to work with Rutger. Um, which was a dream come true. And he was telling us that this was kind of at the, the, the climax of almost like a 30 hour day or something insane. Like there was a bunch of madness going on and um, he had time in his trailer to really think about this. And that was kind of the beauty of Rucker is that he, he has his hand in another world. I really do believe that. And one of his, his, beauties is being able to pluck from that world and bring it to his performance. And um, so it just, you know, that it came from a very special, very truthful place for him. Um, Alkasha, we are we're running out of time, so I'm going to cut no. to the chase. So we are here. We've arrived. We've been on this journey. It is now time to announce to Tim and this packed auditorium, the movie out of all others, you have decided to screen for us between 10 and 1. What are we watching? It is Hollywood 90028, which is a film from 1973. It's technically a horror film, but really you watch it. And I think it's a radical feminist film that is about a man who has higher artistic aspirations, but... Hollywood has kind of not given him opportunity. So now he shoots pornography and the way he takes out his frustration is by strangling women. And it is, you know, it's being re-released by Grindhouse releasing our editor, Bob Murawski runs that releasing company. And he discovered this film. It was kind of lost and um, he restored it. And it is, um, I mean, if this film came out now, the director would be the queen of horror. It would be lauded as probably one of the most beautiful, thoughtful, cerebral, compassionate horror films you've ever seen. And also, there is one of the best shots I have ever seen at the very end of the film. And I don't want to give it away because everybody should go find this movie and see it. But you know when you see certain shots and you get angry because they're so good. That's how this movie ends. So this is Hollywood 90028. So it's been, did you say it'd been lost for a while, but it's, 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 it's emerging back uh, into the world. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, we actually got to see um, a screening at the Los Feliz three here in LA. Um, and it's, it's making its rounds um, around the country. Um, but I just think that, that eventually, like, I think this should be a Criterion release. Like, I think, I don't know, this is this is really up there for me. Amazing. I'm going to look out for it. I mean, it sounds it sounds good. I'm looking forward to this shot. This is the and the, the shot to look out for. This is the last shot in the movie. is is, is one of the greatest shots ever. I mean, there are a, a lot of really great shots in this film, but the last shot made me clutch my pearls and gasp. <laughs> I was just, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> Oh, well, that's it. The curtains close on Hollywood 90028. The guests are milling out, smiling, chatting, and thanking you for taking them on an amazing trip to the movies. Um, all that's left to say, Akasha, is have you had a good time? I've had a lovely time. Thank you so much for having me. This was a real fun treat. It's been an absolute pleasure. And as I said earlier, the first Omen is out in cinemas right now. Do yourselves a favor. It is the perfect movie to watch in a packed auditorium. So go and enjoy. And congratulations again to you for making it. Well done. Oh, thank you. And thanks for having me again.
Thank you so much for watching this interview. Um, I'd love it if you would check out some of the other interviews on our channel. They're all fascinating and unique trips to the movies with some wonderful, wonderful guests. And if you would like to find out more, do hit us up on our social channels. We are at Trip to Movies Pod. That's at Trip to Movies Pod on all social media with lovely content on there. And you can get in touch with us if you so wish. Thanks again.